Hi, I'm Nick Ferrios. We're here at the 13th Annual Art Television Costume Design Exhibition at the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, FIDM. Now, this fabulous exhibition pays tribute to costume design for television, web television, and traditional television as well. We have over 100 costumes from 23 featured shows, 10 of which are Emmy nominated for costume design. Now, let's start with one that isn't because it really is in the beginning of the show. Now, as you can see, take a guess who this is. Of course, it's Batman <laughs> and Riddler. Now, this is from Gotham. Now, this is the final season. Now, both of the costume designers come from Broadway. So they treated each episode almost like a Broadway show and they loved doing that. So it's very, um, I would say very theatrical. Now, let me tell you, the actual Batman suit costume doesn't appear until the end. Now, the costume designers tried to get some of those Batman costumes from DC Comics and Warner Brothers, and they kept saying no. <laughs> they just said, listen, we just want to take a look at it, see how it's made. They said no. Then they finally said, forget it. We're just going to ask for it. Can we just borrow one? You have so many. They said no. So they had to make their own, as you can see right here. Now, this Riddler, gorgeous, gorgeous coat. This is all hand painted as well. Notice the detail on the coat, a dandy, lots of fabulous ties as well. Look at the gold in the tie. Why is there so much detail up there? Because a lot of the times that is where the screen catches you. I call it the three quarter shot. It's from here to here. So you want to have a lot of detail interest up here, especially with the accessories. Let's move on. All right, right here, we are looking at the costumes from one of my favorite shows, Pose. Now, this is Lou Eirich and Ana Lucia McGorty. Now, this is Emmy nominated for period costume. Now, Pose involves 1980s African-American Latino ball culture. Now, this is happening during the 80s, during the AIDS epidemic. The balls were a place where these cultures could go to and dance, feel fabulous, and dress up. Now, it all involves these family units called houses. They had the House of Evangelista, the House of Abundance as well. And you see these gorgeous costumes. Think the 80s. Now, this is a character named Electra. Now, this gorgeous costume, which actually gives me a little bit of Ise Miyake feel to it, this gold costume. This one, Electra, she is inspired by... Diana Ross, mahogany, no less. All right, now let's keep going. Here we have some of the dancers, the house mother from the houses right here, which we love. The house of Evangelista, which is a scrappy house. All of their stuff is thrift shop because they don't have that much money. Now we have Pray Tell right there. Pray Tell, he is the host, the diva of the balls. Now, he's a designer and a tailor, so of course he has to be very fashionable, very stylish. He's a dandy, and also he's the announcer, so he's standing on a podium. He's got to be loud and proud. Love these costumes and what they represent. Now, let me give you a little inside dish. Ana Lucia, one of the costume designers, traveled across the United States from Los Angeles to New York, stopping by in places like Albuquerque, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, to find the right vintage clothing. The 80s vintage clothing, don't tell anybody, shh, isn't that expensive yet. Why? Because it's not considered truly vintage. Thank goodness. <laughs> Guess who we're here with? Of course, Game of Thrones. Now, this is the final season, Emmy nominated for Outstanding Costumes in fantasy. Now, these costumes, of course, are so extravagant, so grand. They really tell the story. Each costume tells the sartorial story of the characters and their evolution. Now, let's come by because we have some of our favorite, my favorite, Sansa. Look at this costume right here. Now, she wears this at the end. This really, talk about telling a sartorial story. This tells the sartorial story of Sansa and her journey, starting from frightened young girl to a reigning monarch. This gorgeous coat. Notice the kind of scales, the fish scales in the bodice and in the dress. Look at the sleeves. Those fish scales, they are reminiscent of her mother and what she wore. The fabric itself, now here's a little inside dish I found out from Michelle Clapton, the costume designer. The fabric itself is the same as what her mother wore when she got married, the wedding dress, many, many seasons ago. 
What is that for? It's for the viewer to hopefully recognize it and see that thread. You see those threads in the costume. Another thread, notice the bodice. It's almost like tree branches and they're growing up. Why are they going up? They're supposed to signify hope and future for the North. Now let's come around because there's some gorgeous details right here. The red sequin leaves, look at that. Now that is supposed to give you a nod to the dark Sansa. Now if you look really closely also, there is the dire wolf, the head, an embroidered head of the dire wolf. Which dire wolf? Lady, which is Sansa's dire wolf. And if you want to know about the fur, the fur up there, that is rabbit fur. And that is to give you a hint of the nod, a wink and a nod to Theon and the capes that Theon wore. There's always, always a message and little threads in each costume, giving you a history and telling you information, visual information about each character. Arya, her slashed asymmetrical coat. Look at this. The whole purpose of this is because it wanted to look like as if Arya herself took her sword and slashed it. And it also helps with movement. It helps with fighting. So that is why it's purposely asymmetrical. Let's continue to one of my favorite costumes right here. Now this is Cersei. Now notice the burgundy red color. Notice the reptilian hints right here in the bodice. Do you see that? Now that is a little nod to reptiles and they're sneaky. You don't trust them. That is why it's reptilian. Also notice the armor, the armor in the shoulders, the studs in the costumes. Her previous costumes, her previous gowns and coats had more patterns, more prints. They weren't studded, now they're studded. What is that signifying? Battle. The burgundy is for Lannister red, but it also makes signify bloodshed. Now speaking of bloodshed, let's come over here. We're gonna end the Game of Thrones right here in this podium with Daenerys. Now this beautiful coat, we may have seen another version of it previous season, but this time around, it's a different color. Now this was made with panels of faux fur leather, and they were all patterned on top of a corset. Now the difference here is the red, that Targaryen red. That's what makes it different. Now also a little hint of that red is to give you possibly the hint of death and bloodshed that's about to come. I love when costume designers give you messages, hidden messages in the costumes. Here we are with Fosse Verdon. Now, I love theater. <laughs> I love Broadway. Of course, Bob Fosse, fabulous choreographer, Gwen Burton, Broadway dancer. Now, they had a secret weapon, Nicole Fosse, their daughter. She provided lots, lots of unique information. And she actually provided a gold necklace, jet drop earrings, and a chain mail jacket of Gwen Verdon's for them to use. She was co-executive producer as well as consultant on the show. So she had special knowledge of what her parents wore. Now here's a little secret. Gwen Verdon had a dual fashion life. She had a personal side, private side in terms of her fashion style, but also a public side. Now, she also loved prints and stripes. You can notice here with that blouse that she's wearing. Now, this is one of her workout wear. And now, with Bob Fosse, he wore the same belt for 30 years. You think he was a fashion peacock, but he wasn't really. And so the costume designer had to make that special kind of touch to know that we're not changing that belt because he didn't change his belt. She also paid particular attention to the fit of his pants as well. And another inside dish is when you think of Bob Fosse, you think of all that jazz, and you think all he wore is black. He didn't. Here we are with another show. This is Outlander, not nominated, but I have to say the costumes are so incredible. It spans through so many periods. Now, this is all about time travel. There is period, there is fantasy, there is contemporary. Now, let me give you a little story. Now, this is all about the new era. This is pre-revolutionary America. So you notice the Native American costumes. The costume designer said it was very difficult to find information about these Native American costumes. It was almost like putting together a puzzle. It's like she had some pieces the feathers, maybe the fabric, the fur, but then she had to sort of fill in the other
pieces of the puzzle, the costume puzzle with a lot of that. Now, I'll give you some information. Notice the red bag. That is made out of porcupine quills. Yes, you heard right, porcupine quills. The costume designer would go to the United States and just buy a bunch of porcupines and writ dye. You can only dye porcupine pills with writ dye. And then she would pack up her entire suitcase to go back to Scotland where they filmed the show, packed with porcupine pills. She was always very scared, thinking that customs would open up her suitcase and go, why the heck do you have all these porcupine quills? It's because she was making these bags for her Native American costumes for the show. Another interesting tidbit, this character right here, now she time travels from the 70s to this new era. Yes, you heard right, 1970s. So when she arrives at this new America, she's not comfortable wearing corsets or big skirts. That's not what she wears. So the costume designer, in fact, she said that for this look in particular, she was inspired by a photo of Yves Saint Laurent and Betty Catru and Lulu de la Falaise. Look it up. This is Betty Catru wearing the Yves Saint Laurent Le Safari tunic. That is what this is all about. The patchwork, she told her wardrobe room to just pretend they're sitting in a cabin for three months. They took a bunch of scraps from the wardrobe costume shop and they put together this tunic using scraps of fabric from the Outlander costume shop. See, you hear all the inside dish only here. Yes, guys, it's the masked singer. Now, this costume designer is Marina Toibina. She is an FIDM alumni. Now, this show is based on a Korean TV show, and it's all about these celebrities that are hiding behind these extravagant costumes and masks. And the viewers and the panel have to figure out who the celebrities are. Now, let me tell you, these took a long time. Each mask took five to seven days to make. Now, we have three costumes right here. The unicorn, the lion, the bumblebee. And the celebrities behind these masks and costumes, this was Tori Spelling, that was Gladys Knight, and this was Rumor Willis. Now, let's talk about this gorgeous, gorgeous lion costume. This one was probably the most extravagant and most time-consuming costume. Marina Toibina, the costume designer, said, this was inspired by the costume designer's love of mythology, Egyptian gods, as well as Joan of Arc, Narnia, and runway shows such as McQueen and Thierry Mugler. The costume itself, now the head that you see, the mask, it's made with gold. It's very heavy, and each mask, in fact, has a helmet built into the mask. So when the wearer puts it on, it's not just the mask, there's a helmet, and the mask is attached to it. And some of them even had fans. There's one costume from the mask singer that we don't have here, it's called the monster, actually had fans inside of it to circulate air. This right here is probably one of my favorites. It took two and a half months to make. It's all about Fab 50s and color, color, color. We're at the marvelous Mrs. Maisel Donna Zakowska costume designer. Now this is for a particular episode that was submitted and nominated for outstanding costume design for period costumes. And this is when the family visits the Catskills. The famous Catskills, they were great for a lot of Jewish families to leave. It was a haven in out near the city for them to go and relax. Now for the show itself, it was all about Mitch going to the Catskills with her family. And so the costume designer wanted to show a rebirth, wanted to show happiness, spring through the fashion. Notice the ensembles, the striped dress, the striped top with the romper underneath. It's all about color, happiness. The yellow dress that you see here when she gets to this holiday resort, it's supposed to symbolize a rebirth, spring, happiness, being with the family. This right here that you see, this outfit is based on a outfit from American sportswear designer Claire McCardinal. And this is Rose, Midge's mom. Notice the color. There's a lot of importance for the costume designer, Donna Zakowska, of color. She studied at L'Ecole de Beaux Arts in Paris as a painter, and they instilled this love of color. And to this day, it influences her in the costume design, particularly for the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Right here, we're in front of some of the costumes for Veep. Now, this is the final season. In this 
13th annual exhibition, you're going to see a lot of final season costumes here on exhibition, and Veep is one of them. This is a great example of contemporary costumes. You see the sheath dress, the fitted dresses right here. Then you have a loose dress. Now, this is all in the finale. This is a dress that uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, the Selena Meyer wore. It was all about fit, that sheath shape. And the costume designer and also Julia Louis-Dreyfus, they love that fitted shape because she could barely move in it, but it almost added to the comedy. Like if she had to bend down or do, it was almost like part of her shtick that the dresses were super tight. Now this is a little dress, a tunic that the daughter wore. And in fact, you see it in one of the final scenes when uh, there is the funeral of Selena Myers. I hope I'm not giving too much away, but she walks into the room. She's like, anybody want margaritas? <laughs> she's celebrating the fact that her mother's funeral with margaritas, wearing this comfortable tunic dress. It's almost like she's been finally released of the burden of having her mom as Selena Meyer through the wardrobe. Now, what I love about Veep is you notice if you watch the end, the funeral scene, it's a quick blurb. It's almost like you blink and you miss it. They show almost like the, you know, the honor, the, the, the tribute to Selena Meyer. And the backdrop, it's all the costumes of Selena Meyer. All the dresses, all of the dresses in mannequins. <laughs> the one lasting legacy of President Selena Meyer was what? Fashion. Now these costumes right here, it's from a TV show, Vanity Fair, based on the novel. Now this was produced by a British TV, uh, sorry. Now this was produced by a British TV network, ITV, and it's also Amazon. Now it's all about the Regency period, the Empire period. Notice the ladies, that Empire line, the waistline is raised up, it goes right under the bust. Now this tells the story of a young girl. This is her, and she plays Becky Sharp. Now she begins in poverty, but she crawls her way to get to the top of British society during this time, and she does it through fashion. The colors change. When she's in poverty, it's all bland, it's all pale. And the more she rises into society in England, they get bolder, jewel tones, more elegant, as you can see. And then when she ends up once again in despair, the clothes become pale. We see some examples right here, this red dress, this typical Regency period on pure dress. This was shown in all of the photos that you see in this show. This court gown, this is what she wore to be introduced to the court. Once again, here, costumes, they play an integral, an important part of telling the story through the visual aid of clothing. Make sure to come visit this amazing exhibition. It's open until October 26th. And the best part, it's free.